moving on from visual q and a and visual dialogue we'll now look at how attention has been modeled and used in various different ways in particular we look at three specific models neural turing machines draw which stands for deep recurrent attentive writer and spatial transformers each of these have had a significant impact on the field of deep learning and computer vision and they either use or implement attention in very different ways let's see each of them this lecture let's start with neural turing machines neural turing machines as the name states denote a class of neural networks that are intended to perform tasks analogous to the to a turing machine just like a turing machine an ntm or a neural turing machine has a memory and read write operations to access to and from memory to perform subsequent tasks however unlike a turing machine you need to have fixed memory to be able to treat this as a neural network and learn operations so here is a high level visualization of a neural turing machine where you have a controller you have a memory and the controller access this accesses the memory using read and write heads to read from and write into the memory so the controller is a neural network certain layers which executes operations on memory read and write and the memory by itself is an r cross c matrix with r rows each of c dimensions now let's ask a question like a turing machine if we do read write operations on an ntm by specifying a row and a column index let's say we want to read the third row and the 10th column can we train such an ntm end to end using back propagation the answer is unfortunately no because you cannot take the gradient of an index since it would be a hard choice similar to hard attention just like how instead of a matrix you had a feature map and let's assume that a CN, in a cnn you wanted to focus only on one patch in a particular feature map and that patch could be decided differently for different inputs and only that should be processed through the rest of the network that would be equivalent to hard attention where you're focusing only on one part and that cannot be back propagated through instead what can we do very similar to what we talked about as soft attention you could now assume that you have a soft weighting function over different parts of a matrix in an image it was called soft attention here we are looking at the memory matrix which is r cross c and we have a soft attention over uh, all the locations in the memory which can be used to read and write from the memory so this makes the neural turing machine end to end trainable using back propagation and gradient descent so we use a very similar idea as soft attention now let's look at these components in more detail so you have a memory matrix at time t given as mt which has r rows and c columns as we already saw the normalized attention vector which is used to read from memory is given by a set of weights wt of i and the weights add up to 1 and each of those weights lie between 0 and 1 and the read head is a sum of the matrix rows weighted by the attention vector so if each row of the memory was mt of i i throw of the memory at time t then you have a corresponding weight for each row in the memory given by an attention mechanism and a weighted sum of all your memory rows 
becomes what the read head gets from memory similarly for writing a part of memory at time t minus 1 is erased using an erase vector so if you have an erase vector et 1 minus the erase vector is what is retained so if you had mt minus 1 which is the memory at t minus 1 into 1 minus wt of i which are the weights into the erase vector et would give you the memory at the new time step and now you add a weighted combination of any external input let's call that input an add vector at you have a weighted combination of that add vector which is added to the memory at that particular ith row how do you obtain this attention vector wt so to do that ntms use both what is known as content based addressing and location based addressing similar to how you do it in a computer what does this mean in terms of learning a neural network each head be it the right head or the read head has a key vector kt at time step t which is compared with each row in the memory matrix mt how is it compared so you take the vector kt the key kt take the cosine distance between kt and the ith row of the matrix mt so that gives you how similar that key is with respect to one specific location in your memory so this is like content based addressing where you're trying to compare the content that you have with the content in one particular row in the memory and the final attention is obtained similar to a softmax over the alignment of the current key vector with every row divided with a particular row divided by the sum of the alignment with all rows you do have a constant beta t here which is you could consider a weighting factor or also what the neural turing machines work calls key strength which decides how concentrated the content vector weight vector should be you could consider that a scaling factor at this time this is the first step which is largely content based addressing now once you finish the content based addressing you combine this with the attention vector in the previous time step so your final attention now is given by your current attention into the previous attention wt minus 1 at the previous time step so you interpolate those two using some scalar parameter gt and that's what you get as the attention vector that you're going to use in this time step are we done no we still have the location based addressing to do to address this ntms perform a circular convolution of the resultant vector with a kernel so if you have an attention vector wt remember which is a vector over all possible memory rows now you perform a, a, a convolution operation with a kernel st this is done in case you have to swap say locations in memory based on this content so this is a kernel that would be decided based on what the controller needs to achieve so if locations of different content have moved for some reason those kinds of changes can be addressed by convolving this attention vector with a suitable kernel to get the final attention vector and this attention vector or distribution is then sharpened using a scalar by raising each attention value to a particular gamma t value to get a sharpened attention vector so sharpened here would mean that the value increases for a high uh, attention scalar value for in a particular position and decreases for another attention value for a particular row where the original value may have been low one can summarize all these steps as you have the attention vector from the previous time step wt minus 1 you have the memory matrix at time t mt 
and you have your controller outputs kt that's your key beta t that's your uh, key strength gt that's a scalar to control the interpolation between the previous step attention and the step attention similarly st and gamma t which is to sharpen so you have you first perform content addressing then you perform interpolation between your current attention weights and your previous time steps attention weights then you perform a convolutional shift with respect to a kernel this addresses location based issues that the controller may want to achieve and finally a sharpening of the weights to decide which part of the memory to uh, to be attending to at a particular time step so that's the working of the neural turing machine as you saw a different use of what we saw as attention now we'll move on to the second method that we said we'll talk about in this lecture which is known as draw or deep recurrent attentive writer this work was published in 2015 and this work is based on the intuition that when humans generate images such as say drawings and sketches humans learn to draw in a sequential manner one first draws the outlines then keeps adding details iteratively draw is uses what is known as a variational autoencoder it is a variant of an autoencoder that's used for generative models to generate images which we will see very soon in the coming weeks lectures it uses a vae to mimic this kind of an approach to generate images why are we talking about this here although we have not covered generative models yet it uses a unique attention mechanism which may be of interest in this lecture so here is an example of how the draw method actually works an image is generated sequentially instead of being generated at once what you see here are 10 different generations where each row is a generation of an image done iteratively so in the initial step so if you look at the last row here in the initial step you have a blank canvas the model then attends to a particular region which is given by this red block here then it draws something in that block then the canvas gets updated the model focuses on another block draws something there then in the next time step the model focuses on a third area of an image draws something there and iteratively over time the model ends up generating this particular image at the end clearly this is an mnist image this is a model trained on the mnist image dataset as we already mentioned draw uses a variational autoencoder which is a variant of an autoencoder which we will see soon this autoencoder has encoders and decoders both of which are rnns an attention mechanism is used to focus on specific parts to generate parts of an image iteratively let's see each of these components in more detail so the encoder and decoder are rnns which means your overall architecture diagram is going to be like an autoencoder which is one column of this diagram here so you have an x input you have a read module which is an attention module then you have an encoder rnn then you have an intermediate step which you can ignore now we'll talk about this in more detail when we go to variational autoencoders then from that in intermediate layer you then go to the decoder rnn and then you finally have a write head that writes onto a canvas to generate some content and both the encoder and the decoders are rnns which means they share weights and you have that particular block repeated over multiple time steps so the image now is drawn on a canvas matrix c which is what you see on top here in t time steps and draw has both read and write heads 
you could say it's inspired by NTMs, to focus on specific parts of the image for reading as well as writing. So the encoder RNN takes four inputs, the input image X, a residual image X hat, we will see what X hat is, is in a moment, the encoder hidden state in the previous time step, the decoder hidden state at the previous time step, you can see that the decoder hid, hidden state at the previous time step is passed to the encoder in the next time step. So notationally speaking, x hat is given by x minus sigma of ct minus 1. ct minus 1 is the canvas that has been drawn at time step t minus 1. Sigmoid of that gives you values between 0 and 1. x minus that gives us x hat which is the portion of the image which the canvas so far has not focused on. So we're looking at the residual image, which is what we call as X hat. RT is the output of the read module, which takes in XT, X hat, and HT minus one from the decoder, the hidden state at time step T minus one from the decoder. Using these, it decides which part of the image to read at this time step. And HT of encoder, is an RNN that receives the hidden state from the previous time step, HT minus one. It receives the output of the read module, RT. And as we just mentioned, it also receives the hidden state in the previous time step from the decode. So here, sig sigma is a sigmoid function. And when we write something in square bra brackets, we mean a concatenation of those values. So when you, for the decoder, when you use the decoder, you have a sampling step here, which we will talk about when we come to variational autoencoders. So you sample a certain vector, which is passed to the de decoder RNN. And the decoder RNN uses the hidden state of the decoder at the previous time step and the sample that came from, for now what we'll call as the bottleneck layer of this variational autoencoder. And the canvas finally at time step t is updated as the canvas at the previous time step plus the output of the write module at that particular time step. This is the overall functioning of the draw framework. Now let's try to understand how the read and write modules work here which are, atten which are our attention mechanism in this particular framework. So the goal of the read and write modules are to focus on specific parts of an image. The way draw goes about this is because we cannot focus just on one region, then you would end up having a problem because you cannot differentiate through that one region which could change for every input. So you have to somehow distribute the weights across the full image. So this is done in two steps in the draw framework. One, it predicts certain filter parameters that we'll talk about. And using those filter parameters, it places Gaussians over a grid of locations in the image whose coordinates are also learnt. And that becomes your attention mechanism. To, to explain this image, Given a particular image, the attention mechanism has to focus on a certain region. This region is given by a grid of locations and the center of that grid, which is given by GX and GY is learnt as well as Delta, which is the stride between different points in that grid is also learnt. So by deciding a three cross three grid, and learning a GX, GY and Delta, the grid is completely specified. We still have some more details to add, but at this time, the grid is specified. You can see here that if you had the grid at a particular location in the image, you see that it focuses on a certain part. And as the grid locations are moved, the 
model focuses on a different part of the image. So what are, what are these grid locations and what is done to get the attention? So at each of these grid locations, let's say it's 3 cross 3 or n cross n in general, a Gaussian filter is placed at each of these grid locations. So if you have a Gaussian filter, you have to specify a variance for that Gaussian. So in addition to the grid center coordinates gx, gy and the stride delta, the model also learns the variance of the Gaussian sigma square which is going to be placed at each of these grid locations and also an intensity value gamma which we will see very soon on how it's used. How it's used. How do you learn all of these parameters? These are all learnt as part of the read or write module. So in case of the decoder or the write module, given the hidden state of the decoder at a particular time step, you have a set of weights which outputs all of these values that we want. Gx, Gy, Sigma square, Delta and Gamma. Why is it Delta tilde? gx tilde and gy tilde, we will see that very soon, just it is only to get, ab, go from absolute locations to relative locations, we will see that now. So given a gx hat and a gy hat, which is the center of this grid, which could be a value lying between 0 and 1, if we want to translate this to a particular position on the image, let us assume the image is an A cross B input image, then Gx would be given by A plus 1 by 2 into G tilde X plus 1 and Gy will be given by B plus 1 by 2 into Gy tilde plus 1. We are converting the predicted values Gx tilde and Gy tilde into specific positions on an A cross B image given by gx and gy. Similarly, delta tilde could be the stride in the, in the same dimensions that you are looking at for g tilde. Now you are converting that to a stride on a given a cross b image by saying that delta is equal to max of ab minus 1 divided by n minus 1 into delta tilde. n are the number of grid locations that you have. As we said, a 3 cross 3 grid or a 5 cross 3, 5 cross 5 grid, so on and so forth. What you see in the figure here is a 3 cross 3 grid attention map. In that case, n would be 3. So you are considering the max of AB, if A and B were 100 cross 80 for instance, if that was your side size of the image, this would be 100 minus 1, 99 by 3 minus 1, 2. So you would get you would be multiplying delta tilde by a factor 49 to be able to separate out the, act, the grid by the stride that is required for that image and get a delta. Now to find out the grid point locations of this say 3 cross 3 grid, you have the final equations here which are given by mu x i and mu x j which gives us the location for the ijth coordinate of that 3 cross 3 grid, so let us say the 1 cross 1 or the 1 cross 2 or the 1 cross 3, so on and so forth. Is, so the mu x i is given by gx plus i minus n by 2 minus 0 0.5 into delta. Similarly, mu x j is gy plus j minus n by 2 minus 0 0.5 delta. These would give you the locations if gx, gy was the location of a particular of the center of the grid. Let us assume that that was at 50, 40 for instance. Then i minus n by 2 would give you, so if you are looking at the first location, n by 2 would be 3 by 2. So that would be minus 0 0.5 minus 0 0.5, that would get a minus 1 and you would say gx minus 1 delta and if delta was 10 pixels, then you would go 10 times to the left, 10 pixels to the left. Similarly, for j, you would get 10 pixels to the top and that would give you the top left location of the grid point and so on and so forth. 
what do you do once you have these grid locations as we said at each of these grid locations you place a gaussian filter given by variance sigma square fx and fy denote those gaussian filters here so the gaussian filter placed at a specific grid location which could be at a particular part of the image gives you different portions of the image so what you see here are the the bottom most and the second from bottom are perhaps positioned at the same central grid location but they have different gaussian variances which you can see in the output of the attended region and on top the center grid location and perhaps the delta is small so you're focusing on a narrower location with its own variance for the gaussian to complete this discussion the read function is finally implemented as a concatenation of a gaussian filtered input image and the residual image so you have x you have x hat which is your residual image then fy and fx are your gaussian filters so you concatenate them you apply gamma which was an intensity factor if you recall so you can now vary the intensity and that gamma is also learned why do we have the intensity factor you could assume that when you draw you may initially draw a light shade and then make it darker right so in a specific time step gamma controls how much intensity that you want to put into generating that part of the image in this case read but gamma is also used for the right even in read you can read only a certain intensity of a part of the image and the right operation follows a complement where the right operation is given by 1 by gamma into fy transpose wt fx transpose so you can see here that for the right patch the order of the transposition is reversed here you have fy x fx transpose here you have fy transpose w into fx transpose so the order of the transposition transposition is reversed to maintain the dimensions and also to maintain complementarity but otherwise the attention mechanism is implemented in a very similar manner for the read and the write and to recall once you have this attention mechanism at each time step so each of these rows are different generations so at each time step the grid location and the gaussians tell you the grid locations the stride and the gaussians tell you which region in the image you're focusing on and in each time step the region that you're focusing on can actually change in this case what you're seeing here is the uh, the output of the right head and you can see that you're seeing different regions and in each region of the canvas you're drawing something which is obtained as the output of the decoder and you repeat this over time steps to get your final generated image the third method that we're going to talk about in this lecture is known as spatial transformer networks which is again a very different approach to use attention and benefit from the value attention brings to cnns so the broad idea here is that cnns on their own can lack spatial invariance so if a certain object was rotated in different ways was located at different corners it may not really work in practice to a certain extent max pooling operations help but they only help with variations or invariance within a small neighborhood especially in deeper parts of the networks spatial transformers are a set of are comprises is a module that is fully differentiable and hence can be inserted in any cnn to bring a certain attention module to solve a particular problem let's see spatial transformers in more detail so here is an example of how spatial transformer networks work so in the first column you have three different images 
as you can see in the first image 7 is slightly modified from how a 7 would look like in an MNIST data set. Similarly a 5 is reduced in size and rotated a little bit and a 6 is moved from the central patch and there are a few noise patches that are included to confuse a model that may want to look at this and classify it as digit 6. What spatial transformer does is shown in column B. Its job is to find out which part of the image to focus on. That's where in a sense the attention mechanism comes in. So you can see here that in the top image it focuses on this part which is the 7. Similarly in the middle image it focuses on 5 but the rotated box shows the orientation in, in which the model needs to look at the content and similarly for the third image which is 6. In column C, spatial transformer applies this transformation and converts this, ori this original image to an untransformed, uncorrupted version where you can find each digit to occupy the full image and be centered. And with the kind of images that you get in column C, in column D, we show how a CNN can now give good classification performance if you attend to the specific part of the image rather than be confused with the full image which could have other artifacts. The spatial transformer network architecture consists of three modules, a location network, a, lo a localization network, a grid generator and a sampler. As you can see here, the spatial transformer network module is something that you can insert between any two convolutional layers in a CNN. So if this was CON4, you could insert a spatial transformer module in between CON4 and CON5. What do you expect to happen? If this was an image where the 6 was rotated, taken to a corner, there were other noisy artifacts in the image, we expect the spatial transformer to focus on only the region 6 and pass it on to the next step V for further processing. Why is this challenging? Why is this required? Remember now that in a sense we are doing hard attention. We are now trying to focus on a specific part in the image which could vary for each input. How do we manage to do this in a differentiable manner? is the core contribution of the spatial transformer networks. The three modules are localization network, grid generator and a sampler. So the idea is to take an input feature map U and transform it into an output feature map V which can then be given for further processing such as to perform classification. So let's see each of these modules which are differentiably uh, which are differentiable and designed in a way to be differentiable so that they can be included in any CNN. The localization network takes an input feature map U which let's assume is of dimension H cross W cross C and it outputs a set of parameters theta which we are going to say are the parameters of the transformation. What does this mean? A localization network could have multiple hidden layers but the output layer of the localization network contains the number of transformation, transformation parameters that may be required to model the problem. For example, if we wanted spatial transformer networks to deal with only affine transformations, then you would have to output six different values. That would be the localization network. The next step in the pipeline as we saw was a grid generator and the final step was a sampler. So in the grid generator we want to now take that transformation values and find out the actual grid. So if we assume that the output V has dimensions H prime cross W prime cross C 
for a particular point xis yis in the input grid and a point xit yit in the output grid the transformation would be given by xis yis would be given by an affine transformation of the point xit yit remember affine can include rotation scaling and translation for the moment so now we have an equivalence between the coordinates in the output feature map v and the coordinates in the input feature map u so the, now the next step is to find out how do you actually sample the points in u in a differentiable manner before we go there let's see an example of the grid generator so here you see that in figure a here you have an identity transformation where you have an original image and the transformation learned retains the same positions for every pixel from u to v and here is another example b where u has a rotated 9 and v learns a transformation that takes a particular set of pixels in u and maps them to all four corners of v now we need to find out how do you sample these pixels which would form the output pixels inside v okay so you can see that in this case a distorted 9 has got transformed to a canonical 9 which a cnn is aware of and can classify this leads us to the final and important step sampler which draws this equivalence between v and u how do we do this v i c denotes the target feature value at the ith location in channel c u n m c denotes the input feature value at location n m in channel c and then you have iterators that go to h and w which are the entire dimensions for each channel in u and then you have a sampling kernel which which tells you at which location xis and xi and yis you need to sample to get a particular output in the output feature map v so what kind of a kernel do we uh, can we use one example that you can use is a bilinear sampling kernel which states that the kernel k can be given by max of 0 comma 1 minus xis minus m similarly max of 0 comma 1 minus yis minus n what does this do if you observe carefully let's assume that for a particular pixel location in v the corresponding xis and yis given by the transformation was say 45 and 34 for some reason so 45 minus m is an iterator that would go from 1 to capital w and n is an iterator that would go from 1 to h so you can see here that if xis was 45 and m was 50 for instance you would then have 5 1 minus 5 would be minus 4 the max would be 0 and you would not sample the value at 50 so where would you sample this would get activated only when m is equal to xis so you would only sample the pixel at xis to get the corresponding location at vic so this becomes a differentiable way of sampling and focusing on one specific region of u to get the subsequent feature map v how do you back propagate through such a kernel we obviously know how to back propagate through rest of the operations but how do you back propagate through such a sampling kernel it's not hard the max 0 of 1 minus xi minus m is similar to many other operations that we have seen so far for differentiation so dou v by dou u would simply be the both these max terms themselves so that's what you would get because you would have a u here and dou v by dou xis would similarly be u c n m and max into 0 
1 minus yis minus n. So this first term which depends on x goes away and you would have that this term would become 0 if m minus xis is greater than or equal to 1. It will be 1 if m is greater than xis and minus 1 if m is less than xis. That's how you can compute the partial derivative of this transformation and this completes each of the modules, the localization network, the grid generator and the sampler to be able to go to one specific part of the input image for uh, to use that for further processing. Your homework readings for this lecture are once again the nice blog of Lillian Weng on attention, a nice introduction and overview of draw by Jonathan Hui and a nice review of spatial transformer networks by Sikho Sang. Here are references. Thank you.